Good evening, everyone. I'm Oliver on Sci of Zadio with my colleague and friend and our first employee. Uh, and I'm, I'm really here to tell you that we're all about from seven nows to create the best Swift and iOS applications in the market and to show you how really the compiler should work and will work and now works. <laughs> so I hand it over to, to Arpad, my colleague. Thanks, folks. Uh, it's a real pleasure, pleasure to, to be here. Uh, and uh, let, us, let us first of all <coughs> forward to you the, the warmest welcome of the Hunger and Swift community. Uh, and uh, no, just all right. it's, it's okay. <laughs> and uh, well, I set up my little talk. Uh, please wait a few. Moments. I hope I hope I haven't spoiled anything. <laughs> All right. All right. So uh, let's start with uh, a little poll. How many of you guys know what this is? Few. Awesome. So for those for those who don't know what this is. This is like uh, asymptotic complexity notation, or commonly referred to as uh, big O notation. So this kind of stuff can show you mathematically how fast your, I don't know, function or algorithm runs. And uh, so those of you who went to like college and studied computer science or programming or whatever, will surely recognize this. But uh, I'm curious how many of you know that there is a constant factor involved in this, in this equation. Yeah, like, there are a few people who know that there is a constant factor in this. And how many of you have been told that uh, this constant factor can just be ignored because it's insignificant? Yeah, yeah basically everyone uh, was, was told in university that this constant factor can be ignored. But of course, we, now we are <laughs> grown-ups and we all know that this is complete bullshit. All right? Because constant factors are pretty much the, one of the essential components of real world physical speed and, and time. So <laughs> you might be asking yourselves, why is this guy here ranting about computational complexity and education and whatever? And the reason for that is that uh, today <coughs> I'm going to talk about compiler optimizations or more specifically non-pessimizations, which are a special case of optimizations that I have, uh, I happen to have named like this. And, uh, and of course the, the point is that compiler optimizations often help you reduce your constant factors, and thereby making your, your code uh, faster. And uh, in order to demonstrate just how important these optimizations and these constant factors are, I've brought you uh, a little demo, which I'd like to uh, show now. So, so what I have here <coughs> is uh, I've written a, lit a little hash table in Swift. So I will just uh, I will just show you the code. It's a dead naive open addressing hash table. It's not actually important what the code is. Uh, I just show, show you it uh, as, a, as a demonstration of uh, what it looks like. This is an actual re-implementation of a hash table. It's not from the standard library. It's, I've written it myself. Uh, it's, it uses well-established methods for, for lookup and insertion and deletion. And it's written in Swift. And then I have a... Uh, a little driver, driver program, which just tries to insert and then look up 300,000 uh, integers in a, in a newly instantiated hash table, and it measures the, the elapsed time using an state. So this is just a, that naive benchmark, as you would expect. So let's compile 
uh, this program without optimizations. And we are just running the Swift compiler. Uh, and let's measure how fast it runs. Well, almost three seconds, uh, 2,900 milliseconds. I'm not impressed. I mean, seriously, Swift is supposed to be Swift. And uh, on the decent like MacBook Pro, uh, like three seconds for 300,000 elements is ages. So, <clears throat> almost like JavaScript. Yeah, it's it's almost as bad as like JavaScript or Java. Or I don't know, uh, but. But let's now compile this with uh, some optimizations. We specify that we want to optimize the code to some extent using the dash o flag. We wait for recompilation. Oh, yeah, I, I should have run make. Thank you. Thank you. I'm used to uh, compiling C code. Yeah, Swift doesn't have the dash o3 optimization level; it only has dash o. So we have compiled the code uh, with optimizations, and now we run the, the benchmark again. This time we have reduced the running uh, the execution time to about one second. Not bad; like it's three times faster, but I'm still not impressed. I'm not impressed at all. We can, however, turn on uh, even more optimizations. You might be familiar with the idea of uh, whole module optimization, right? And if you rerun the performance test, now we are talking, right? So this is the kind of effect that the optimization has on like, real world code and actual Swift code. So, after trying to convince you that optimizations are important, uh, let me just uh, start talking about some specific kinds of optimizations. But for that, we first need to discuss what, uh, what do I even mean by, by optimizations or, or non-pessimizations specifically. So, if you are familiar with, with like uh, compilers in general, you might know that there is a, a sort of there is a concept called canonicalization, uh, which I'd like to equate with the word non-pessimization in this talk. Canonicalization is basically a means in which a com uh, with which a compiler uh, can uh, transform code to a unique uh, unified representation, uh, so that. Uh, so that it can optimize it better and, and perform uh, more uh, code transformations on that. So in Swift, these are the optimizations that are performed even if you specify O none, which means that you don't want any sort of optimizations. So the absence of optimizations is a lie. Even if you specify that you don't want any of them, you will still get some of them. And these are the sneaker bastards we are going to talk about tonight. So in this, <clears throat> in this uh, figure, I've tried to summarize the architecture of the, of the Swift compiler, which is, mm, let's admit it, pretty conventional. Uh, you, get, you, you write a Swift source code as text, then the compiler tries to parse it. It parses it to a, a syntax tree, an abstract syntax tree, uh, and then it performs type checking and various phases of semantic analysis of it, uh, on it. Uh, it outputs then a, a, an AST with, typed annotation, with type annotations, and then it, it generates uh, what's called SIL, the SIL intermediate language. This is a kind of intermediate representation that is, uh, it's not yet LLVM IR, it's not yet machine code, but it's already not just a, a syntactic representation of the code. It's a bit uh, lower, level, lower level than uh, ASTs, 
and uh, the compiler uses this to analyze the memory, the control flow, and various other lower level properties of your sweep program, and to use these uh, discoveries or, or these specs to optimize your code. So what Silgen outputs is just a naive mapping of the AST to this intermediate representation, which is called raw seal. This raw seal is ridiculously inefficient. Like it has a lot of, lot of trivial uh, pieces of redundancy, a lot of silly details that make it, it very slow and very inefficient. And then the canonical, canonicalization pass uh, uh, transform it into canonical seal. So this, is, this canonicalization pass is uh, what we are going to talk about. And uh, I try to uh, annotate these boxes with the appropriate compiler flag. So if you are curious uh, about how exactly uh, the, the compiler does these transformations and you want to discover or, or, uh, uh, more information about how it works, then uh, I encourage you to like, uh, run the compiler on a, on a file, on a Swift source file with uh, various compiler flags and like, examine, the, examine the, the output at each, at each stage. So after uh, the generation of canonical seal, uh, there is a, an optimization, further optimization pass, and then it generates LLVM, and from there LLVM takes over and uh, optimizes uh, the intermediate representation further and outputs machine code. But that's, that's not what we are going to talk about. We are going to talk about the canonicalization passes. So how you should imagine these canonicalization passes? What, what do they do uh, intuitively? Well, imagine that you are a very important person, I don't know, uh, a rich businessman or, 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 or a politician or whoever, who doesn't really need, uh, have time to like, clean up his or her room. And as a result, his or her room is a mess. And, uh, it doesn't matter, yes. Yeah, it probably doesn't matter. But, <clears throat> but there is like a janitor who will come and clean up after him or her so that his room looks tidy and nice. And these three uh, phases are sort of equi uh, equivalent of the Siljan and the programmer, both of uh, them probably will write naive code at first. Uh, and then the mess that is outputted is naive or raw uh, seal code. And then the, the janitor guy is the equivalent of the canonicalization passes that will clean up the uh, raw seal. Now, let's talk about the how. Uh, I've brought you three specific kinds of non-pessimizations, uh, and we will see why this is important. First, let's talk about memories. Uh, of course, memory is a famous song from the musical Cats, which is, which is one of my favorites. So I try to uh, present an appropriate background image for the slide. Maybe it worked, maybe it didn't, didn't I don't know. Uh, the point is, I brought a simple example. This is a function with an in-out argument, which just sets its in-out argument to a number. Uh, this is simply going to be translated to uh, a function with an argument which is a pointer to integer, and then the, the, uh, the reference of the integer will be uh, assigned this value. But let's see uh, what kind of seal this uh, extremely simple function translates to. Oh my god. This is, this is a lot of code, right? There is like allocations and copying and literal and function application and another copy. And oh my god, strong release. I didn't use any objects. Why strong release? Seriously? And then returning an empty tuple unit. So let me explain to you. Uh, what these phases, what these stages in the, in the code actually do. So the problem is that Swift features uh, closures, and the way that closures and the in-out arguments interact is, uh, let's put it this way, problematic. So you can just 
use in-out arguments without, without thinking. Uh, at least the compiler can't. And uh, so what the, what the compiler's developers did is that when you have a, a function with one or more in-out arguments, the in-out arguments as pointers will not be used for all accesses to, to the argument. Instead, first, a so-called shadow variable is going to be allocated. Now, the shadow variable is uh, here in this code is given the name percent %1. Uh, and alloc box is a heap allocating instruction. It returns a reference counted heap allocated pointer to an integer. And then uh, the, in -out the value of the in out argument be uh, uh, behind the pointer is copied into this shadow variable, into this box. And then every access to the in out argument uh, is. Uh, is performed through this shadow variable, so it's, a, it's just a copy, and the compiler is pretending to, to use the, the argument, but it really uses the shadow variable for reads and writes uh, as well. And then at the end of the function, immediately before it returns, the value of the shadow variable is copied back into the memory pointed by the in-out argument. So this is a lot of unnecessary work. We can see that all of this is completely superfluous, superfluous because, uh, because we just set a simple variable and that's it. So what does, what does the seal look like after canonicalization? It's much better, right? There is nothing extraneous stuff in here. It's just what it should look like. It should have looked uh, like in the first place. Yeah, it we are looking rid of all, of all of the mess. Yeah, it basically gets rid of all, all, of, the, all of the extra mess. So it just allocates a, uh, uh, an integer literal and puts it into the pointed memory. And, and then it returns. Uh, let's see how, how the compiler optimizes <coughs> the calling of such a function. So you can see that we here uh, declare a variable and then pass its address into the function. Yeah, this is pretty messy uh, again. But specifically, the pain point is uh, the alloc box instruction. Again, because of closures and uh, the ability of closures to capture external uh, variables, it is necessary for the compiler to assume that by default, every variable is uh, allocated on the heap. But of course, uh, here we see that it's not really necessary and it's also ridiculously inefficient to just allocate everything on the heap because uh, heap allocations are usually very slow. And so this alloc box instruction, which is a heap allocation, and the strong release instruction, which also involves heap deallocation potentially, but in, uh, in all cases uh, the, the decrementing of uh, a global uh, reference count which is protected by a lock, so it's also kind of slow. So this should be turned into something more efficient. And indeed, what happens is, if you read through this code, and then compare it to the canonicalized version of it, the only changes that I've noted are the alloc instructions, the alloc boxes have been turned into alloc stacks. Or there was only one alloc uh, box and it was turned into an alloc stack and uh, the strong release was turned into a dialog stack. So now there is no reference counting and no heap allocation. So this code behaves uh, as it should behave performance wise. Right, so memory is, memory access is one of the most important aspect, uh, aspects of a program. But uh, in Swift, we have got automatic reference counting and I'd like to talk about the architecture of the compiler which handles this part. So we can see that there is, this is a really trivial example. We have an empty class just so that we have a class. We have a function which accepts a parameter of that type and then the real uh, thing happens in the juggle foo function. We instantiate 
and uh, this class, we then copy the reference of the pointer uh, f1 into the variable f2, and then we pass that pointer into the useful function. So this is like trivial again, but you can see that I've commented what happens. When we instantiate the class, we allocate some memory for it and we initialize it. Then the copying of the pointer involves, involves a strong retain. And then after, <coughs> we have used f2 uh, and, uh, and f1, and they both go out of scope. Then uh, both pointers need to be released strongly so that their reference count is decreased and so that the uh, instance is properly cleaned up and deallocated at the end of this, its scope. So this is the code that is generated. And specifically, you can see that uh, the assignment, the let f2 equals f1 uh, line, translates to load, which is basically copying <coughs> of memory. In this case, the copying of the pointer that points to the instance. And then a strong retain of that uh, copied value. And then after the, the function call, we have uh, two strong releases uh, of the value corresponding to f1 and the value corresponding to f2. But what happens if I rewrite this code a little bit? I have just deleted the function call. So we are not, no longer passing the copied pointer to use, to use foo. And as a result, you can see that the strong retain of F2 is immediately followed by a strong release thereof. Which means that there is a redundant retain release pair. And we should, honestly, we should get rid of this because it's an extra uh, two locking and uh, global variable manipulation operations. And indeed, this does happen. Uh, I'm sure you, you have all memorized the full seal of the previous slide. Uh, and you can tell that the only difference between this slide and the previous one is that now there is no strong retain and there is no strong release of the F2 variable. So the redundant retain release pair has been eliminated. And this is, of course, the, the simplest uh, possible example. But the Swift compiler is much much smarter than that, and it looks for all sorts of patterns in common patterns in your code and optimizes uh, uh, those as well. And finally, I'd like to talk about unified functions. Now, unification is not universally good. For example, you can here you can see the unification of utensils. Someone actually tried to do this, and I'm not sure if the if the result is pleasing. I mean, what's even a splayed? And why do I want to use it? Let's, let's not go there. But, you know, in Swift, functions, are, uh, functions have a central role. Because Swift is a functional language, unlike some other languages which are dysfunctional, but let's not talk about them. Uh, now, we have three functions here, which are really, again, trivial. Uh, but, uh, but the problem is that one of the functions has itself an argument which is of a function type. So increment result really takes a function and calls it and uh, returns its return value plus one. Now, <coughs> the problem is that uh, obviously because it's got a function, uh, a function typed argument, it needs to accept any kinds of functions. So, for example, it needs to accept closures as well, but it also needs to uh, accept global plane functions. We don't really want to implement every global plane function as a closure because it takes up uh, twice, as more, twice as many space as uh, would be necessary because, you know, a closure is represented by a pointer to the function uh, invocation or the function body and the pointer to its context, its environment, which contains the captured variables. And uh, also, a closure can sometimes be optimized less efficiently than a, a plain function call. It might be necessary to actually call through the function pointer. It might be necessary to 
then it may be the, the, that the compiler can inline it and so on. So we do love plain old functions, which are just like functions in C. So what's the magic behind the, the fact that even if we call increment result with a plain old function, and if we call it uh, with a closure, it still works. It compiles and it runs correctly. So the recipe is simple. The increment result function, which uh, I have omitted the implementation of because it would be too long, takes a closure. It always takes an argument of closure type, and that's what the at owned, at Kelly owned annotation in the original uh, seal means. So it's also, uh, always going to be called by a closure, uh, with, with a closure as an argument. Now, you can see that get answer is a, is a convention thin function, which in seal means that it's a plain old function, global function, without a context. Now, if you see how the, uh, the individual calls to increment result uh, are going to be translated to seal, First, uh, you, uh, you see that uh, uh, yeah, in the direct and wrapped call parts, direct call, uh, you just call get answer, and it will just call it as it is, like a C function. But, in, but when you uh, pass it to, to the increment result function, a thin to thick function uh, instruction is emitted. What this does is it basically takes a plain old function pointer and wraps it so that it looks like a closure. In particular, it has a trivial you know, null pointer, context pointer. Uh, so it, it, it behaves uh, like a plain old function. But you can now uh, pass this value to the, the other function, which takes a closure. And this is very efficient because this way you don't have to declare all functions as closures, but you can also call, uh, pass plain old functions to don't ignore constant factors. Constant factors also need some love. Uh, the second takeaway is that these canonicalizations in the compiler improve the architecture of your code because you don't need to micro-optimize your code and they don't try, uh, you don't have to second guess the language or the language designers in every possible scenario. So you can just write your naive code and you can be sure that it will be as efficient as you would expect it intuitively. And the, perhaps the most high level uh, message is that it's worse to optimize fundamental abstractions because fundamental abstractions are what, uh, what are uh, used throughout your code. And if you optimize those, namely memory and functions and for example, so, so many other fundamental abstractions, then you will gain significant improvements in performance. So in case you were wondering uh, whether you can see the compiler in action yourself and the code in action, I've put all the code that's presented here uh, on GitHub, so you can clone it, check it out, and otherwise, uh, I thank you for your attention, and if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you.